Good morning. I would like to call the uh, Subcommittee on Federal Workforce, U.S. Postal Service and Labor Policy to order. And as we uh, do uh, in, in every subcommittee and full committee, we read the mission statement of the Oversight Committee. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Um, I will now move into my opening statement. Last December, the White House's Deficit Commission outlined a plan of action to address our Nation's fiscal woes. Included in the report was a recommendation to reduce the size of the Federal workforce by 200,000. Recently, the House Budget Resolution adopted a similar policy in assuming a 10 percent reduction via attrition in the size of the Federal workforce. White House officials have repeatedly stated that they would implement many of the Commission's ideas, but they did not incorporate a Federal workforce reduction proposal into the President's February budget release or his recently issued deficit reduction plan. In fact, the President's budget, while acknowledging that the Federal workforce has actually grown by 325,000 since President Obama took office, requests an additional 15,000 new Federal workers for fiscal year 2012. The size of the Federal workforce now stands at over 2.1 million, the largest Federal workforce in modern history. At the same time, our economy has lost over 4 million private sector jobs, and the unemployment rate hovers around 9 percent. According to the Office of Personnel Management, the average pay and benefits of a Federal employee in 2010 was $101,751, a rate of compensation the Nation can no longer afford. The members of this subcommittee appreciate our talented Federal workforce and the critically essential services it provides. However, the current size of the Federal workforce is fiscally unsustainable. Congress has an obligation to consider all policy reforms that halt the sprawl of government and force agency heads to make government more efficient. Several Republican members have offered bills to shrink the size of the Federal workforce. I myself have introduced H.R. 821, the Zero-Based Budget Act of 2011. This legislation would require all departments and agencies in the Federal Government to provide a, find a funding justification each year, as well as a summary of their cost effectiveness and efficiency. Today's witnesses include two distinguished members of Congress, Representative Lummis and Representative Marino who have both introduced legislation that would institute tough measures to halt government growth and produce a smaller, leaner Federal workforce. At a time when our economy is in a recession and budget deficits are at staggering record levels, taxpayers can no longer be asked to foot the bill for a bloated Federal workforce. This hearing presents an opportunity for lawmakers on this committee to hear important testimony on how best to right-size the Federal workforce. I thank the witnesses for appearing here today, and I look forward to their testimony. I now recognize the distinguished uh, member from Massachusetts and ranking member, Mr. Lynch, for opening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, let, let me just try to reset the, the discussion that has been put forward here in terms of right-sizing the Federal workforce. Let me just put some numbers out there that, are, that I think are striking. Uh, we have uh, two types of Federal employees uh, that work for our, our government. Our two, uh, types of Federal workers. Uh, we have the traditional Federal employees uh, who are the target of this, this hearing, and then we have a group called private contractors. Now, in, in common parlance, people think of contractors as companies, but in this United States government, contractors are people. So rather than hiring under the Bush administration employees, they simply hired contractors. Now, not only do we have the largest number of Federal employees, 2.5 million people, but if you look at the number of folks that we have added to government, the government payroll uh, by the Bush administration, it comes not to 2.5 million, but to 10.5 million contractors, people who are working under government contract instead of uh, employees. So what we are doing in this hearing is we are ignoring 80 percent of the cost. We are completely ignoring the contractor side of this equation, 10.5 million people, and we are instead focusing on 2.5 million Federal employees. It strains the limits of credibility 
to ignore 80 percent of our costs, instead to point the finger, and blame, finger of blame on Federal employees. It continues to mystify me in the midst of this recession that while we all are in agreement that it was the folks on Wall Street who caused this mess, uh, we don't have hearings on Wall Street up here. The finger of blame has gone around and around, and where does it fall? It falls on Federal employees. It falls on teachers. It falls on firefighters. It falls on police officers. It falls on their right to bargain over terms and conditions of employment. It is obscene that we are focusing today on the 2.5 million employees of the Federal Government while we are completely ignoring the 10.5 million contractors and grantees that work for this Government. Bear in mind that there is great need to, to reduce the costs within our government. No, no question about it. We have got to reduce spending. But you have to ask whether we are really serious about it when we choose to ignore 80 percent of the cost. There is not a word in here about reducing the number of contractors. I have traveled to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan many, many times. Uh, 14 times, I think, in, in Iraq. I have seen the troop levels go down from 170,000 to 45,000 today. But I still see 100,000 contractors in Iraq. And when you compare what a, an Army private or a PFC for the United, Mar United States Marine Corps is making per month with the private contractor costs, or if you compare what the State Department employees uh, are making, overseas compared to what these private contractors are making. It is astounding. It is really astounding. So if we are serious about reducing costs, then we need to look at the contractor community. The 10.5 million people are out there that are on the government payroll. Just because President Bush decided to hire them as private contractors instead of Federal employees, it doesn't mean the cost isn't there. In fact, Think about this. If we're reducing, if we're seeking to reduce costs. If you if you force a federal employee out, they're going out and they're going to collect their pension, probably get health care benefits. If you cut a contractor loose, that's all savings. That's all savings. So why aren't we looking at that? This will be a great hearing. I, I'm I have a lot of figures, a lot of data, and uh, hopefully we'll get we'll get the complete picture out there. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, I am delighted that you held this hearing. I really am. And uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the uh, Chairman of the full committee and the distinguished gentleman from California, Chairman Issa, for an opening. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, uh, Congressman Lynch, for giving me the opportunity to come after you. Uh, and I don't mean come after you personally, <laughs> but. Uh, have at it. Bring it on. No, no. It's, we have two congressional colleagues here. And they both have business backgrounds. Congressman Marino, like you, I spent uh, decades in, on the factory floor. Uh, one thing we understand in the private sector, and I think you are going to hear it in their testimony and in any Q&A, we understand in the private sector that you are probably absolutely right on some portion of what you just said. Two million people, 10.5 million full or part-time contractors, all or part. We are not, we're not debating that. They all fall under this committee's jurisdiction. The real question is, how are we getting the best value? And the one thing I believe that this committee has seen in hearing after hearing after hearing, and we will continue to see until we make real fundamental changes, there is no cost accounting. Now, in the previous time under President Bush, I sat on this committee and other committees, and rightfully so, I saw them not do cost accounting. They simply hired a bunch of people to get us through the early days of the war. And on this side of the aisle and on your side of the aisle, we started complaining that, well, where is the cost justification for this and that? Why is it it costs hundreds of dollars a gallon to bring a, a, a gallon of fuel out to the combat end of the line? The real question is not, is there waste in government? We exist because there is a tremendous amount of waste. and we have done very little to deal with it. Now, 
As we look at attrition or changes in the Federal workforce, including an end to arbitrary insourcing, which is what has been happening under the Bush administration, arbitrary insourcing, they tap contractors on the shoulder, tell them their contract is going to be ending, and they say, we will give you a pay raise if you come work for us now. Felony, stupid behavior for anyone to do. And we have business people here who will explain exactly how stupid it is to arbitrarily pay more than you need to. What this committee needs to do, and Mr. Lynch, I want to be very much in partnership with you on this committee, we need to cost benefit both outsourced and insourced cost. We need to move this government toward making a genuine decision about what makes long-term and short-term sense and to do the kind of analysis. Additionally, and Mr. Ross, Chairman Ross, I think, did a very good job in his opening statement, we need to go to a system in which we justify the individual pay of individual members of the Federal workforce, dynamically understanding that some people in the Federal workforce are underpaid and their jobs go unfilled and it is difficult. We have seen this before. Some, their jobs become less valuable, but the scale and the system has no flexibility even for new hiring. We need to change that. The private sector understands that supply and demand varies, that what you have to pay to hire a software programmer in 1999 in Silicon Valley is very different than 2001. It was a radical change between you hired people from anywhere and stole them from your competitors to, oh, there, were, there was an abundance. That abundance disappears, the price goes up. I look forward to this committee having an honest dialogue, not about what was wrong in outsourcing under the Bush administration or wrong necessarily in insourcing under this administration. We have an obligation to get it right, to figure out how sensible government accounting can, in fact, put using your numbers, 12.5 million full or part-time jobs to better use at better value for the American people. I believe this is a good start today. I believe we have the right witnesses to help us set the tone for why it is not about how many workers we have in-house or how many contractors we have out-house. The question is, are we getting our best value? And until we have a system that we can all be confident on a regular and constant basis makes those decisions, those, if you will, dynamic scoring so that we get the best value, we are not going to right-size the Federal workforce in-house or get the best value from our contractors out of the House. I look forward to working with this entire committee. This is the most legitimately bipartisan issue we will have on this committee. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for an opening. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly thank our ranking member. I want to associate my comments and, uh, with those of the ranking member. And, um, you know, I am listening to all of this, and, um, and I am glad we are doing this hearing. But at a time when Congress is looking for ways to cut spending, I certainly appreciate that everything should be on the table. However, I believe that Federal employee employment is, in particular has gotten more scrutiny from the majority than it deserves. While I agree that serious changes must be made to improve our financial footing, I disagree with the viewpoint that Federal employees should shoulder a disproportionate amount of that burden. As I have mentioned previously before this committee over the past several months, I have been meeting with Federal workers who are rightly dismayed that their jobs and benefits are being used as a political football on Capitol Hill. Federal employees saw their 2011 pay raises blocked by the recently enacted two-year pay freeze, and they are deeply concerned with the daily barrage of news about the possibility of further congressional actions affecting their benefits. My office has been deluged with inquiries from Federal workers and their families concerned about agency furloughs and reductions in force, wondering how they will keep <clears throat> paying their mortgages and feeding their children if their paychecks are suddenly stopped. And these are the same employees that on this side of the aisle took a 5 percent cut and probably will not get another pay raise for the next four years. But at the same time, they work on the Hill and they hear 
our Republican colleagues say that in a fragile economy, we cannot afford to tax the rich, but yet and still their pay cuts, they are being cut in pay, and they are, again, wages being frozen, and they are not making the money that the, riches, the rich folks are making. Give me a break. Despite assertions to the contrary, the Federal workforce has decreased significantly since the 1960s when measured in terms of the number of workers per capita. According to the Office of Management and Budget in 1962, there were 13.3 executive branch employees for every 1,000 Americans, while as of 2010, there were 8.4, the lowest level in the past 50 years. Furthermore, we have seen <clears throat> that decreases in the Federal workforce are often met with increases to the contractor workforce, as Mr. Lynch stated. On this point, I would like to be very clear. Cutting the Federal workforce is not a magic solution to our financial troubles. Cutting the Federal workforce does not diminish the demand for taxpayer services. For that reason, proposed indiscriminate cuts stand to have two effects. One, increasing the more costly contractor workforce, or two, reducing the efficiency and effectiveness of the services delivered to taxpayers. Recently, in response to Representative Loomis' uh, pr proposed legislation, Max Dyer, the CEO of the Nonpartisan Partnership for Public Service, had these simple words to say. History has shown that government-wide hiring freezes result in neither smaller nor more effective government. Indeed, downsizing the Federal workforce without strategic workforce planning will result in skill gaps an increased reliance on contractors and ultimately a government that is less efficient and effective than the American people deserve. None of the proposals we will consider today have adequately addressed Mr. Steyer's concerns over blanket cuts. And so I do look forward to the hearing today. I look forward to hearing our witnesses. And I agree with the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Issa. This is a problem that should have bipartisan solutions. These are issues that affect the very people that we work with every day, the very people that we go back to our offices and see uh, in the next hour or so, the ones that get the early bus, the ones that work hard and give their blood, their sweat, their tears, their compassion to us Americans. And I do want us to stop beating up on uh, public employees because they play an integral role in all of our, 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 our society. And I, don't, I want them to come to work knowing that we appreciate every single thing they do. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. As you know, we do have two panels today. And, um, and based on an agreement uh, that I have with our presenters now, I, we're going to limit their uh, testimony to five minutes each with regard to the, their respective legislation. Uh, and I will now recognize the distinguished woman from uh, Wyoming, Ms. Loomis. Well, thank you, Chairman Ross and Ranking Member Lynch and members of the committee. It is an honor to appear before your subcommittee. Um, I want to assure the, uh, the Ranking Member of the full committee of my deep regard for public employees. I was the State Treasurer in my State. I had a loyal, hardworking workforce that contributed mightily to converting our portfolio of savings uh, from $6 billion to over $8 billion during my eight years as State Treasurer. They are hardworking, dedicated employees, and I see similar skills, abilities, and dedication every day here in the Federal Government. Uh, I am proud of public workers. I am proud to be a public worker. Uh, my bill is not designed uh, as an attack or an indictment of their skills. It is recognition of where we are um, in 2011 with regard to the size of our Federal Government, and what we need to do to address the impending, unsustainable shortfalls, our debts, our deficits. If we wiped out every single Federal agency 
that is not interest on the debt and an entitlement program mandatory spending, we still would not have enough money collected in revenues to cover the expenditures of this country. It is going to take every single program, every single person, every single branch of government, every entitlement, every mandatory spending program in order to solve the problems we have today. So this is a small component of the problem, and I bring it to you uh, because of my experience in Wyoming State Government. Wyoming has the smallest population in the nation. We also have, per capita, uh, the largest cadre of state, local, and county government workers. Now, in order to maintain a level of service, but nevertheless adjust to Wyoming's boom and bust economy, since our economy really is just entirely based on minerals, uh, the revenues of the state of Wyoming go up and down as mineral production and mineral prices go up and down. So I have learned to adjust to a growing government and a declining government over the course of my uh, political life as a Wyoming legislator, uh, as a director of a state government agency, and then uh, as state treasurer. Among the tools that we believe works well is the opportunity to um, up and downsize the state workforce. Uh, in a way that does not hurt the employee, and you do it by attrition. Uh, and this bill, uh, the bill that I am sponsoring, um, the Federal Workforce Reduction Act of 2011, H.R. 657, uh, does reduce the Federal workforce by attrition. Under my bill, the Federal Government could hire one employee for every two that retire or separate, for whatever reason. So nobody loses their job. Nobody loses their benefits. These are people that are leaving voluntarily through retirement or um, separating from government for whatever reason. And the notion is, of course, that for every one, we could, the government could hire one employee for every two that retire or separate. This notion of attrition has been replicated by the House Republican budget resolution, which assumes a more aggressive three to one replacement rate. Uh, it was also proposed, as has been pointed out, by the President's Deficit Commission, which called for a less aggressive 3 to 2 replacement rate. And I prefer attrition to rigid firing or hiring freezes. I don't just want smaller government. I want a more efficient and responsive government. Um, now, let me give you some of the details of my bill. Uh, I did decide to exempt the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, and Veterans Affairs from the new attrition policy. Uh, I also include a general national security waiver of the bill's hiring limitations. Um, and I did so to acknowledge the preeminent importance of national security, our constitutional obligations versus our statutory obligations. Um, working with Republican staff on the House Budget Committee, we estimate the Federal Workforce Reduction Act would save something in the ballpark of $35 billion over 10 years. The more aggressive attrition policy in the House Republican budget, combined with a federal pay freeze, would save $248 billion over 10 years. I am on the Appropriations Committee, and we talk repeatedly about how we are having to cut programs. And Democrats and Republicans on the committee alike are saying, but we need to know that when we cut programs, we are not just retaining middle and higher uh, administrative positions. We need to know that the people who are actually doing the work in the bowels of government, those workers who are less highly paid, are the ones who are retained, and not just the mid-managers and higher-level managers in the Federal Government who are highly compensated. Uh, one closing comment, Mr. Uh, Chairman. In my home state of Wyoming, if you look at the pay between Federal employees, State employees, County employees, the Federal Government is compensating their employees by far, by far more than State employees and other government workers. 
so what we are seeing here is an opportunity to return some normalcy as we downsize the Federal Government in order to save our country and in doing so uh, not inflict pain on people by rifts and other policies that really do hurt a family's well-being. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I again thank you so much for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you, Mrs. Lummis. I uh, now recognize the distinguished gentleman from the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Mr. Marino. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding this hearing today and giving me the opportunity to testify. And I also want to pay my respects to Chairman Issa. Thank you. Our nation is more than $14.3 trillion in debt, a record high and the equivalent of approximately $46,000 owed by every child born today. It is estimated that in 2011 we will have a Federal budget deficit of more than $1.6 trillion. 2011 will represent the third straight year in which revenues to the Federal Government have fallen below spending by more than $1 trillion. We are borrowing approximately 42 cents for every dollar we spend. Our current fiscal course is unsustainable and disastrous. The American people have sent a clear message to Washington, and the American people deserve more. We must cut spending, reduce the size and scope of the government, and keep taxes low to grow the economy and create jobs. Earlier this month, I introduced H.R. 1779, the Federal Hiring Freeze Act of 2011, because the time for talk has ended and the time for action is now. We cannot continue down this road of big government and deficit spending. The general framework for my legislation and the concept that we must put a freeze on Federal spending is not a new idea. President Reagan's first official act upon being sworn in as our nation's 40th president on January 20, 1981, was signing a presidential memorandum calling for an immediate freeze on the hiring of civilian employees in the executive branch. In a statement at the signing of the memorandum, he stated that the freeze was a first step toward controlling the growth and size of the government and reducing the drain on the economy for the public sector. My legislation builds on Reagan's plan by imposing a hiring freeze on Federal employees until the budget deficit is eliminated. And I want to add into this, this includes also contract individuals. The bill contains specific limited exceptions in which hiring would be permitted, such as time when our nation is at war, vital national security interests, Federal law enforcement purposes, to honor prior contractual obligations, reassignment of personnel within agencies to fill needed positions, positions to facilitate the orderly transition and operation of a new presidential administration and the U.S. Postal Service. These common sense exceptions assure that the most critical and basic functions of our Federal Government remain unaffected by the freeze. The fact is we need to manage the government more like we manage our businesses. I am perplexed that people are opposed to this idea. I recently was informed that we do not need to operate the government like a business because the government can print money at any time. This argument does not resonate with me or my constituents in the 10th District of Pennsylvania. I worked in a factory until I was 30 years old. I worked my way up into management from sweeping floors. When the revenues weren't coming in, we cut our costs. One of the ways we cut our costs was by not replacing people when they left and asking the remaining employees to produce a little more, and they did. And this isn't about firing or laying off, either. This approach is what we need to do in Washington with Federal employees. My legislation is not an attack on Federal employees or the work that they do. I have the utmost respect for Federal workforce. I am and I was one. As a United States attorney, I had the best and the brightest attorneys and staff working for me. This is why I know that Federal workers are willing and able to step up 
to be a part of the solution to our nation's problems. According to the Congressional Research Service, the total cost of the Federal workforce in 2010 was $590 billion, with a B. This accounted for nearly 30 percent of total Federal receipts for that year. We cannot and should not allow the cost of the Federal workforce to grow while millions of Americans are struggling. This legislation calls on the Federal workforce to take a prominent role in the process of leading the country out of our current fiscal crisis. Obviously, a hiring freeze is not, I repeat, is not the silver bullet that will unilaterally lead us out of this crisis. It is a part, but also it is a start. It is in combination with other efforts that we have started to enact. For example, the step that we took in slashing our own office budgets by 5 percent. Just because this legislation is not the cure-all for the nation's ills does not mean that we cannot begin deliberately addressing an issue that is important to most Americans. This bill would be a good faith step towards reducing the size of government and addressing the out-of-control government spending. And again, I want to emphasize this is a start. This includes not only the permanent employees, but contracting employees and any other budgeted payout to an individual or an entity. It's not a layoff program. Please don't twist this into a layoff or getting rid of Federal employees. It is by attrition. When they retire, when they uh, leave for whatever reason, pass away, you name it, that is the position that we do not fill. The time for action is now. Once again, I would like to thank the Chairman and Ranking Member for giving me the opportunity to provide my thoughts on this important issue. I stand ready and willing to work with the Committee and my colleague from Wyoming on any issues or any amendments or, or any editing of this bill that I submit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marino. Ms. Lemus, thank you well. Thank you as well. Uh, we will now take a short recess as we prepare for our second panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Chairman.